good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name's Chad Woodward. Uh, I'm the Director of Trade and Investment at the British Embassy uh, here in uh, Saudi Arabia. I'm delighted to welcome everybody to this fourth and um, final day of our inaugural UK-Saudi uh, FinTech Week. It's been a fantastic week. Uh, on day one, we heard from Saudi Arabia and the Saudi government uh, about their ambitions for the FinTech sector. Uh, we then moved through to day two, when we heard from a panel of execs uh, working in uh, the fintech sector in Saudi about the opportunities and challenges here. And then yesterday, we had a fascinating policy dialogue on how to create the right regulatory environment to have a, a safe and thriving uh, fintech industry and sector. Uh, today, we're gonna hear from the UK fintech community about the opportunity to partner and invest with the UK. Uh, and it's gonna be split into two sessions. Uh, first of all, there'll be a session on uh, venture capital, uh, and then it'll be followed by a half an hour break. Uh, uh, and then we'll be asking you to dial in again for the second session, uh, which will be with a group of UK FinTechs already addressing the Saudi market about their offer to Saudi Arabia. As Chad would say that, Throughout this week, um, you know, I know there have been several uh, high-powered webinars uh, on how the UK and Saudi Arabia can work together. Uh, and um, the chairman of policy, Catherine McGuinness, and I have, uh, have both been a, a host on, on some of the sessions. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, very keen to, to encourage uh, greater co collaboration. Uh, and uh, as you know, the UK has been very much uh, at the financial innovation uh, fintech has been, uh, we're very proud to be known as the fintech, uh, fintech center of the world. Uh, and whether that's, we started the first ATM back in the 1960s and telephone banking in the 80s. Um, but we are keen uh, to, uh, to, to work with you. Uh, and I hope uh, uh, as Lord Mayor to come and, and visit and to, to talk about the opportunities uh, around the, uh, with the UK and what we have, um, what we what we can do together. Um, so I'm delighted to be a part of this. Um, I'm, I, as I said, I apologise uh, again, um, but I hope um, now that my mayoralty has been extended uh, to um, November 2021 uh, to come and visit uh, visit uh, Saudi Arabia and, and to have uh, discussions about how we can collaborate uh, uh, with different fintech companies uh, from both. Uh, outside Saudi Arabia from the from London and within Saudi Arabia uh, and so look forward to, to working with all of you uh, um, going forward so uh, thank you very much and again I apologize that um, I wasn't there at the start uh, and thank you uh, Lord Mayor uh, 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 and thanks for uh, uh, for covering that so well. Uh, we're delighted to have you on board. We're delighted to have your energy. Uh, and we're particularly delighted to have your 30 years of experience, both in the financial services sector, but critically also struggling roles uh, uh, within public life. Because as you know, uh, key to driving innovation in this sector is about uh, how uh, authorities and the regulators uh, uh, facilitate that environment for us. Uh, um, so um, uh, it's important to have that understanding of, uh, of both sides of the fence. So thank you very much uh, for those words of context. Uh, I'd now like to uh, invite the, uh, uh, the panel to join us. Uh, and I'd like to hand over to Matthew Yeomans, who's going to uh, moderate the panel. Matthew is the editorial director of uh, the key industry digital platform called the FinTech Alliance in the UK. Uh, and he's going to uh, uh, introduce the panel uh, and moderate the session. Uh, over to you, Matthew. Uh, Chad, thank you uh, very much um, and welcome everyone to uh, what I hope is going to be a very uh, engaging discussion. <laughs> today around kind of the UK fintech sector, uh, um, investment into it, uh, opportunities uh, for uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, rather than me 
trying to introduce this esteemed panel, I'm going to ask them to uh, explain who they are because they're going to do it much better than I can. Um, Vika, can I start with you? Of course, surely. Uh, thank you. So, real quick intro for those of us um, who don't know us. Um, I work at Anthemis, and Anthemis are uh, fintech specialists with focus on early stage startups. Um, I am a founding member at, at Anthemis, so, so a long story to tell. Uh, today, I'm running our financial wellness focus fund. And I would say that in the past probably 11 years of my career, I've spent it working with both incumbents and startups in the financial services arena. Um, we've done so multinationally, you know, spanning across US, Europe, Africa, and of course, the, the, the GCC area. We've spent quite a bit of time in here. Um, we've also got several of, of our portfolio companies that are either looking to or already working in, in Saudi Arabia, such as uh, Moven, who have signed a deal with, uh, with STC, we're, we're proud to say. And, um, you know, overall, um, very happy for that reason to, um, very honored to be part of this, this panel because I think there's a very big opportunity for uh, the UK and uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia to, to collaborate. And um, if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll share one more thought uh, before, before I move on. Um, but I think that, you know, when we talk about fintech and collaborating across countries and, you know, VC innovation startups, it's not about the money. Um, it starts with a check, but it's really about collaborating and finding the right partnerships to be able to create value and um, build a more resilient tomorrow, much like uh, Saudi's Vision 2030. So for that reason, I'm very happy to be here today. Vika, thank you very much. Um, Norris. You are up next. Tell us about yourself. Thank you. My name is Norris Koppel and um, I'm the founder of a uh, challenger banking service called Moniz. And uh, how we are different compared to others is that we are focusing on underserved audiences such as people moving to new countries and uh, needing to set up a new life uh, and uh, needing a new bank account. Uh, so from day one, we have been focusing on these individuals and pretty successfully so we are basically a mobile uh, phone-based app that uh, anybody currently in 31 countries in Europe can use to open a bank account in the UK or any of the European countries. And we provide uh, services that typically a uh, mainstream bank would also provide. We started focusing on, on solving a real problem for our customers and we have succeeded in a way that uh, since the start of 2015, we have signed up uh, over two and a half million people um, uh, that are using the service. And what we have also proven is that uh, thanks to this focus on uh, severely underserved segment, uh, we have uh, seen successes in, in a way that we have become their primary salary account. And that is a difficult thing to pull off. And typically this is the, this is a place where all the banks uh, want to be, to be in the heart of customers' financial life. And uh, we have uh, succeeded there. Excellent. Thank you, Norris. Um, Dominic, can I go to you next and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Am I unmuted? Great. Uh, hello, everyone. And firstly, thank you so much for uh, inviting me on this panel. It's a, it's a great honor. So my name is Dominic Perks. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Hambro Perks. Hambro Perks is a venture capital firm uh, based in London. Um, with a number of different fund strategies. Uh, what do we do? We back exceptional entrepreneurs um, who are building kind of world-changing companies. When I look at our portfolio um, across the various strategies, we have about 60 companies and a good third of those are what you would call fintech businesses. So they are um, in the financial services arena. Um, we also set up uh, two and a half, three years ago, a specialist investment company called the InsureTech Gateway. Um, the InsureTech Gateway uh, has a dozen investments. It backs very early stage and indeed incubates very early stage InsureTech businesses. This is an area that we think is particularly attractive um, and that's seen some great success uh, over the last couple of years and we're looking to scale that out. Our connection with the region, I think, is quite unique as well. So um, I spent a lot of my time uh, in the Middle East. Um, Hambro Perks 
isn't just a London centric firm, albeit we've done a lot of investing in London. And one of our great companies that we're, we're thrilled to have backed is Trade Ledger. So you're going to hear from Martin McCann in a second. Um, but we also have a, a, a large investor base in the Middle East. And we've helped a number of the companies that we've backed in Europe to come to the Middle East and to trade in the Middle East. Um, moreover, we are the first uh, VC firm to be um, registered at ADGM um, in Abu Dhabi. Um, and we were the first VC, international VC firm to get an international license uh, by Sagia to operate in Saudi. So we actually have offices in Riyadh and in Abu Dhabi, as well as in London. Um, and we are just about to launch a MENA focused fund um, a good portion of which will be investing in fintech businesses. And indeed, we have already started to make investments in the region, and our first one was a fintech business. So I could talk all day, Matthew, I will pass on. But one final thing, you know, I would love to um, have follow up meetings with anyone that's on the call. Entrepreneurs, we're interested in helping you, backing you, supporting you. Investors, we'd love to hear how we could work with you. Co investors as well. It's a team sport, venture capital. Um, you know, we'd, we'd love to meet you too. So thank you. Thank you, Dominic. M Martin, I thought that Dominic was going to do your spiel for the, the whole thing for you there, but uh, but it's over to you, last but not least. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, so I'm Martin McCann. I'm the founder and CEO of a fintech business, uh, which operates globally called Trade Ledger. Uh, Trade Ledger was actually founded by myself and my co-founder in Sydney in 2016. Uh, we're now headquartered out of, uh, out of London. Uh, one of the reasons for that is the ecosystem and network around fintech in London is unparalleled in the world. That's why we've chosen to put our headquarters there. Uh, and a good demonstration of that is the, the type of investor that we found in, in Dominic and Hambro Perks uh, is not the type of investment model which is available to us in Sydney. And in fact, some of my uh, colleagues who have some of my friends who've uh, uh, started uh, insure tech companies have benefited from the insurance gateway initiative that uh, that Dominic mentioned as well. Uh, so, so very much we have a very a global focus. Uh, what what do we do? Uh, well, we provide uh, effectively a uh, a new market sector of technology which is becoming known as lending as a service uh, to commercial and business banks and alternative providers of funding to businesses. Essentially, we provide a, a very modern and scalable uh, global layer of technology that enables uh, lenders of scale to provide funding to mid-market and, and larger clients uh, much faster and uh, you know, much more accurately in terms of risk assessment and decisioning than they could previously. Uh, this is a market which has massively been underserved. There's a, a 1.2 trillion pound gap in business lending globally. Uh, mostly in the sector that we're serving, which is the two to 20 million pound ticket size, which is virtually blue sky in terms of, of being addressed by the traditional major banks or the alternate lender providers. Um, and uh, we're slightly different than, uh, than Moniz in that we're not providing the lending services ourselves. Uh, we provide a complete platform of white label technology, uh, which is what we're world class at, to world class lenders to enable them to drive innovation uh, and connections and distribution through different types of ecosystems and networks uh, to really help to solve the problem of uh, the, the 1.2 trillion gap at, uh, at scale. Uh, our customers uh, in total uh, touch or fund uh, almost 15% of the globe's uh, business finance uh, requirements. Uh, so we deal with very large multinational uh, trade banks in a number of different areas and product sets. And uh, we deal with um, also alternative and specialist lenders who also have uh, the capacity to or are very large scale uh, also. Uh, I mentioned several times we mentioned we, we focus globally. One of the reasons why we do the tech and not the, the fin is we try to avoid the, the regulation and specialize on providing that tech capability that most financial services institutions really struggle with. Uh, so from that perspective, we have the ability to deploy in any country in the world with the exception of China, which is quite a, a unique market that we've decided not to enter at this point in time. Uh, and uh, we can be up and running in a new country in as little as two hours, potentially, uh, that such is the, the pace of technology which can be brought to bear 
uh, to scale out new sort of innovation services in, in, in business finance. Um, like Dominic, I could uh, I could speak all day about what we're doing, but that's probably a good point to stop and, and move forward with the panel discussion. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Um, before we uh, explore some of the questions that I think will be really interesting for us, I just want to uh, say to all the attendees uh, on the webinar, uh, we'd be very welcome to uh, answer some of your questions that you'd like to post to the panel. Uh, the way we're going to do it is please do send questions through as the panelists are chatting. But for um, just to keep things neat and tidy, we're going at the end of the session to have about 10 minutes where we can answer your questions. So we won't be doing it as a rolling feast, but we will uh, be looking at the questions and, and picking, uh, picking some to put to the panel. Um, <clears throat> Martin, that was very interesting. Thank you very much for your and for all of you for your overviews. And Martin, you picked up on something about your own personal decision of why you moved to the uh, UK and, and the promise of the UK fintech sector. And I think as an overview uh, for the discussion and for our audience today, uh, it would be really interesting to hear from all of you um, why and how the UK fintech sector in general has become so successful over the last 10 years? What are the factors that have made it the powerhouse that it is today? Uh, Dominic, um, can I go to you first to uh, chat to this? Of course. So, so we've got some very unfair advantages that are kind of obvious, but maybe not that obvious. So first of all, it seriously helps that we speak English. It also seriously helps that our time zone is where it is. It's possible to operate internationally from London. Um, we also have the English law, which is enormously helpful and well trusted and respected globally. So, you know, actually, language, law, time zone doesn't half help. It gives us a kind of an immediate advantage. But look, there's just a huge heritage from the city of London um, of, of finance and financial innovation. It's a hub of international talent. You know, Brexit notwithstanding, um, London is a fantastic place um, to to live and to work. And it has just the city of London itself is a melting pot of, of talent and innovation. And, you know, it's sort of a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, that, that there's such success that has come out of the city of London that it attracts more. Um, so I think the, the, the context is, has been a great um, benefit to the emerging fintech business and of course you know the 2000 this is much written about the 2008 crisis arguably accelerated you know the fintech industry significantly as um and, and that aside from regulation and, and and other things is in my mind a, a flood of talent away from the banking industry and into uh fintech i was looking at our portfolio at hambro perks Amazingly, 20% of our portfolio are uh, one of the founders is an ex Goldman Sachs MD or partner, which is quite interesting. Um, and that's just one bank. There's just a huge flood of talent that's come into fintech post crisis. And I think that's really interesting. The next interesting question will be what will the corona crisis do to tech, the technology industry? And we, we expect trends like fintech and fintech 2.0 to be further accelerated by the current crisis great thanks i, I asked the questions around here dominic no no just joking <laughs> um let me uh vika let me let me ask you now from your perspective of of seeing it from anthemis's perspective what is what are the what are the driving forces for you about the uk fintech scene yeah I mean, I think we've had, um, I mean, first of all, let me completely agree with everything um, Dominic has said, um, but, you know, not, not repeat it. Um, I think that the UK fintech ecosystem has been so successful also because, in a way, it's been purposefully built for that purpose. And there's been a tremendous and organized effort in um, empowering, let's say, for key enabling categories, right? What, what do we need for this ecosystem to flourish? We need demand for whatever the startups are producing. We need talent in order to you know, work um, at this wave of innovation. Um, we need regulation that um, works with the startups in a way to um, create a sustainable system. And of course, we need capital, which is where, where we come in. Um, I mean, I think of those uh, four categories that 
demand, I think, is kind of you know self-explanatory. The UK has, was already a financial services um, centerpiece around the globe, right? So there's um, demand and, and, and an expectation of good quality, especially around financial services from both enterprise but also consumers. Um, you know, very na digitally native um, native consumers. On um, on the talent front, again, I'll echo what uh, Dominic said, but also um, add to that that it really doesn't hurt that we have a steady inflow of talent coming out of some of the world's best universities right here at home, um, which which is definitely making the the, the talent bit um, I think quite unique um, in the UK. Um, the the very interesting bit i think for me is, is regulation um because uh the uk's approach to policy in this in the space um can be categorized at least as, as collaborative if not progressive um and think of some simple statistic like in the uk um in order to set up a limited liability company it costs about 12 pounds in Germany, uh, to set up uh, the equivalent, uh, a GmbH, you need a minimum share capital of 25,000 euros, 2,500 euros in fees, and about 2,500 to 3,000 euros in fees to professionals that are required to actually help you build the business. I mean, just, just simple statistics like that, I think, help, um, help people understand why it's a good place to come to, to the UK and, and launch your, your FinTech. Um, yes. And the other thing I'd love to mention is is actually the FCA sandbox, where you know more than 700 companies have already uh, participated in the regulatory sandbox since um, its inception around 2014 or 15, I think. Um, now expanding into reg tech and other other areas. And I think the point to remember and understand here is that the FCA doesn't lower barriers. It's more about bringing together stakeholders to understand how they can work together to create a sustainable environment rather than just loosening the rules. Um, and I think that, you know, Anthemis, actually, I, I, I smiled when, when, when Martin, you were, we were talking about the financial crisis because Anthemis was actually founded the day after Lehman Brothers collapsed. And uh, the reason why, why we did is, is because, you know, we could see just how much there was to change, just the sheer volume of opportunity and frankly having the burning desire to, to, to go fix it and um, you know at first we we did it on on our own time um, invested out of our own balance sheet because you know we we, we always whatever we try we always try first on on, on our own dime and um, you know now if you look a decade later we've got over a hundred investments are under you know under our belt um, raising another fund to to invest even more um, ranking top five fintech investors in Europe, number one in insured globally, um, top three in Europe for portfolio company satisfaction, that one in particular we're very proud of. Um, and much of that success has been because of the environment. Um, so, so just because of when we started, I think for me, it's a very interesting exercise to think about our growth story um, alongside the UK fintech uh, ecosystem growth story. And I just find that it's, um, there's definitely linkage and causation there. Thank you. That's great. It's a good perspective, Vika. Um, <clears throat> because I know we only have limited time, I'm going to uh, going to move on to a to another question now. It's a specific one um, that I'd like uh, Norris, if you could kind of pick up on first. And it's about one of the real kind of big strengths that have come out of UK fintech over the last decade, and that's the rise of challenger banks. It's been a massive success story. Um, <clears throat> What do you think investors need to understand about the current banking sector in the UK and, you know, and the, the challenger bank sector to help make informed investment decisions? Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> so I'd like to highlight that UK is the most competitive space in the world uh, to, 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 uh, to start a challenger bank from. So the customer expectations are absolutely enormous. So banks are giving stuff away for free. Nobody pays for anything. Customers are absolutely spoiled and 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 expect everything to be free. So, in um, in in uh, unlike many other countries in Europe. So as I mentioned, there is no monthly charges, for example. So it's very difficult for a challenger bank to uh, to come out of the gates and and uh, and uh, the ability to charge customers is very very limited. So you must be um, you know providing a true value in order for uh, customers to actually pay for your service. 
So little things like, you know, real-time onboarding, smart money management, you know, real-time payments. This is all that uh, everybody now expects. This is a minimum, so there is no differentiation there anymore. Um, also, would like to highlight that European and, and UK challenger banks, they mostly started uh, uh, in 2015 and initially it was really, really difficult to see uh, how one is better than the other or how they are focusing on different things. And today, uh, five years later, it's now very clear that uh, you know some some companies have been focusing on on one country. Uh, you know, it has gone viral. They have been seeing massive uh, growth in user numbers. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it has been uh, perhaps uh, you know so building a sustainable business has uh, has maybe received a little bit less attention. So I think um, it is fundamentally critical for for a challenger bank to prove that they, first of all, have a very uh, differentiated proposition. Generic products don't work anymore. And also what, what we have learned in a hard way uh, is because we are today in, a 30, in 31 countries and Moniz has a very global mindset. So we really want to be a global business. So what we have found that, uh, for example, if you succeed in, in the UK, it's actually your approach in Germany or France you can't go in with a very generic proposition. You have to make sure that how do you localize a product so it feels like a local product. Selling British goods in Germany it does, just doesn't work. Um, I would I would also say that from uh, investor uh, perspective, uh, if you if you look at any of the fintechs, uh, looking at um, you know sustainability of the business model, solid solid unit economics is is uh, absolutely fundamental. It's now critical. So COVID nineteen actually has been pretty helpful because uh, you know everybody kind of uh, was uh, getting the same hit from 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 the same thing. And that has really forced uh, many companies to review uh, really uh, their uh, focus in unit economics, business model, what works, what doesn't. But I think also it's incredibly important for a challenger bank to, to you know, make sure that uh, you're focusing on the right kind of a customers. Being everything for everybody just simply doesn't work. Um, and and uh, sooner or later, if you do that, you will you will see some uh, you know you will see the moment where you have just paid too much uh, for a customer who never converts into active customer. And um, the question I guess I have is it also uh, what kind of a model do you want to build? If you are building a UK focused business or Challenger Bank, if you are building a global one, what do you want to do? Do you want to uh, you know, spend your life as an entrepreneur and CEO acquiring licenses and raising billions of uh, dollars in order to, to launch in all these countries and do it all yourself? Or do you find that maybe partnership model and collaboration is a way forward, which is uh, has been pretty successful for us? So I think if you reinvent the wheel, you have a pretty high risk of uh, failure and, you know, our, you know, startup life is risky enough. So I think partnership model definitely feels like a right one for us. And also, um, if we ever launch in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, we would always be looking for uh, uh, a partner, partnership model, partner banks, partner lenders, uh, companies who provide, uh, you know, rails to payment systems and so on. Sorry for a very long answer. No, no, no. That's it's it's uh, really interesting to kind of kind of get under the hood so to speak of 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 the thinking of of a, of a challenger bank and what's worked and and and, and kind of challenges around that um one of the interesting things of course about kind of uk fintech and the growth of challenger banks is is of course what challenger banks have done have understood uh the needs of the way modern consumers are are working with their money how they're thinking about things but also <clears throat> how they're using technology and uh, this combination of kind of understanding technology with kind of the need of the market has become crucial. And to, with that in mind, I'd like to ask Martin, um, I'd like to come to you now, Martin, ask you a bit of a question about kind of technology and that and innovation. And as we know, innovation is sat at the heart of UK fintech growth. Can you, can you just tell me a little bit about how pioneering technology has helped new fintechs both find success on their own and also, and I think relevant to you, certainly forge important partnerships with other established financial institutions? Uh, yeah, sure, Matthew. It's a, a good question. Thank you. So uh, I think if you look at the development of fintech, it, it's still quite nascent uh, as a topic um, in, in its current guise. So obviously, it's gone through uh, different iterations. Uh, as the Lord Mayor said uh, back in the, in the 80s, telephone banking was, uh, was essentially fintech. 
but in the current sort of uh, 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 sort of cloud era where, where technology is moving at an increased rate, it's still quite quite nascent. And I think very much that the focus has been in, in the order of the words fintech. So it's 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 financial services innovation enabled by by tech. And I think where we're moving, um, and this leads on from the, the the comments that Norris made about the challenge of banks, is uh, disruption uh, led by tech creating new fin services or very disruptive fin services. And we're kind of at that uh, that inflection point uh, now. So if you look at where we are today uh, in banking. Uh, tech innovation um, everywhere tends to be uh, what I would call leading edge rather than bleeding edge. Uh, so what does that mean? So it's enterprise grade, highly scalable, uh, secure, a robust technology which has been adopted uh, at scale uh, by new entrants and and uh, and uh, incumbents alike. These are things like uh, APIs uh, to better access data in a, with better customer experiences, uh, machine learning, uh, deep analytics. Uh, digitization and virtualization of, of, of existing types of financial services. Less so mainstream adoption of things like uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies, for example, which, you know, it, its wave is, is still to come. Uh, but the reason for that is the innovation in these heavily reg regulated markets um, are, are more related at this point in time to the networks and the partnerships uh, created in the ecosystems than the specific technology. So all of the technology that uh, we're all using today uh, you know, it's it's it, it, it's it's very modern. It's very leading edge, but it's not experimental. Uh, so uh, one of the great things about London is, uh, from our offices in in Hoxton, I can generally walk to or uh, travel to all of the major uh, global brands and players I want to partner with uh, within 30 minutes. And a lot of the top fintechs uh, who I want to learn from or partner with as well are in the same area as me. So that network is is absolutely critical, and I think up until now has been more important in finding niches for new disruptive financial services for fintech than uh, the the tech per se. Uh, so if I if I look at um, the way forward, it's very very sim sim symbiotic. Uh, I think banks can't build the innovative tech um, that companies like us, Trade Ledger, provide easily uh, for lots of, lots of good reasons. It's it's not their forte. They're bankers. Uh, and fintechs often can't get the, the types of skill uh, that companies like uh, Moniz uh, are, are trying to get globally without partnering with, with fintechs. So it's a very, very sim symbiotic relationship. And I think you're starting to change the, the, the very fabric of, of financial services with this adoption of, of tech and this change in symbiotic model. Um, so we're, we're starting to, to look at some of the global models uh, or partnerships as signposts to what's going to happen in the UK and, and other local uh, national markets as well. So I would sort of point to uh, the Apple credit card. The Apple credit card is actually uh, furnished and issued by, by Goldman Sachs. Uh, but Goldman Sachs has got uh, entry into a retail banking market with almost a billion customers overnight. Uh, I mean, that's an example of a service which is not potentially that innovative, but it is disruptive because it's using uh, technology for great distribution of an existing uh, financial product. Uh, going forward, I think we'll see more disruptive um, uh, financial services based on technologies. So one of the ones that we're tracking quite closely is uh, the fact that uh, Citigroup last year launched a new e-wallet capability targeted at tech companies specifically uh, like Google, for example, uh, to provide essentially uh, uh, outside of the banking infrastructure, uh, a merchant or an SME current account. So that effectively uh, creates a whole wave of new type of uh, disintermediating uh, innovation capability. If companies like Google can provide their own financial services, uh, they already have the digital connection with the customer and those networks without actually having to be a bank. And I think that's, that's ultimately where the next battleground for fintech is, uh, where sort of tech is going to become uh, more forefront in creating more disruptive services. And partnerships are going to deconstruct the uh, I guess the, the traditional uh, manufacturer distribute and service model that has persisted for decades in uh, in, in financial services. Brilliant, uh, thank you, Martin. That's very uh, kind of in depth and kind of good shaping of of the the state of technological innovation and and how it's playing out and also partnerships between fintechs and and, <clears throat> and major financial institutions. I think hopefully for um. For our audience at the moment, what we've done is, is paint a pretty good picture of 
of kind of where where the UK fintech sector scene has come from, its strengths, <clears throat> how it's working in terms of kind of meeting the needs of consumers, but also of the technological innovation and partnerships coming through that. I'd like to ask both um, Dominic and Vika now, if possible, um, <clears throat> some really kind of strategic and, and pointers for uh, our audience about kind of what are the most important factors that uh, external investors need to consider when looking to invest in uh, in UK fintech? Um, Dominic, can I start off with you again? Sure. So for us, above all, it's the talent. It's the quality of the management team, the founding team, their passion, their drive, their vision. It's, it's, it's people that build these businesses. And so we spend an awful lot of time uh, really getting to know founding teams of, of early stage businesses, because that is the critical thing. Of course, we want to know that it's an innovative business model. Of course, we want to know that the competitive landscape seems attractive, um, that it's a large enough market opportunity. But in the end, what we've learned is that it's the quality of the founders and their propensity to allow us as an investor to support them that that delivers the very best results and the, and the and, and the largest businesses. That's great. But yeah, I um, mean, you can't you can't replace talent, can you? That is There's uh... one other thing, Matthew, which is in fintech in particular. Um, there's great value with domain expertise, actually. So um, you know, at in certain companies that we've backed, they wouldn't have been possible without deep technical expertise that can either be technological or can be financial. But you know, financial services is complex and um, and requires domain expertise, in our opinion. So that's important too. All right, brilliant. Vika, what 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 can you add to Dominic's thoughts there? Well, I think from, from from our personal experience, what's worked great is that I think any time an external investor is looking into a new geography or a new sector, uh, partnering with the right parties can unlock major value. Um, that's exactly what we're looking to do in the in the GCC and Saudi, and it's exactly what we've been doing so far and why we've had great success working with international LPs. Um, I don't think it's only because of the of the fact that we're fintech specialists, but because we understand how to work with, with corporations, with families. Um, our, our, it's our background, and also collaboration is kind of deeply seated into our mission. So we know that it's a key component to to making um, venture successful in in any area, any geography, uh, frankly. And I think what's important to to note here, and you'll forgive me because it, it's not exactly linked to, you, to to your question, but I think it's it's relevant nonetheless is that it's important to remember that it's not about brazenly believing that only startups will win or only incumbents will win. Um, I think we still hear that in the market sometimes. Um, it's not about one side winning at all. It's about an equilibrium and, and a balance of value add that, that each side can bring through the right partnerships and, and collaborations. Um, they can enable um, augmenting the sum of the parts, uh, so to speak. So, as collaborative disease, that's where we come in. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, let me, uh, uh, this is the, the stage where we go into the quick fire round, or where I go back to everyone for their for their points of view on, and, and what I'd like to talk, and I actually want to pick up on, on a point that, that Dominic had made, and it was about coming back out of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and I'd like to ask you all just quickly, what do you think the strengths UK FinTech can bring to the greater financial sector and society as a whole, as we look to back bounce from what we've all been going through. Um, Martin, quickly, can I go to you first, maybe? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a, a great topic, I, I think. Um, if you look at what's going on, we've got the, the need to recapitalize global industry on a scale not seen in, in peacetime ever before. Uh, my view is, is uh, greater adoption of tech um, disruption and digitization of banking services is the only way that that's going to happen. What we're seeing with our customers who are major trade banks is programs of uh, sort of digital uh, services, use of new digital data source and, and product and services innovation for business customers. 
which originally had a trajectory to implement in three years, now has a target to implement in nine months or sooner. Uh, so, so I, I think that's that's creating a uh, like a turbocharge effect on, uh, on 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 innovation. So, in some respects, uh, we're we're resetting with uh, with the crisis. Uh, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of businesses who suffer and some that don't make it through this. But those that do, I think, will come out much stronger and will be served by much better financial services. Uh, because uh, our estimation is that the, the level of origination queries that banks are getting from businesses at the moment is approaching 100x of what they are able to cope with in normal times. Uh, and the need to fulfill and make decisions is probably around 25x uh, above what they've ever been able to achieve before. So uh, necessity is dr driving faster innovation and faster adoption of new technologies uh, and a very um, uh, a, a very internal look at what capabilities the bank needs to acquire in order to drive that. I think the UK is well uh, well positioned to be one of the global winners because it's always been a forward-looking market from a, a regulatory and legal perspective. And I use the example of uh, PSD2 and open banking. Uh, open banking was a was a high risk and bold move uh, by the regulator in the UK to extend on and fill in some of the, um, the inadequacies or, 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 or gaps in PSD2, in my view. Uh, what, what was it challenging? Has it had issues? Yes. But does it actually put the, the ecosystem in the UK ahead of most other countries in the world to adopt new disruptive services in the post-COVID era? I would also argue yes. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Nor Norris, can I ask you now, because obviously you are, you know, as a as as leading a challenger bank, you're at the front line of of consumer needs, um, and a lot of a lot of uh, consumers and society are are going to be uh, looking to these services. How do you see um, bouncing back from from COVID nineteen? I think I'd like to say two things. <clears throat> so first of all. Again, coming back to the uh, uh, the the need to have a, um, a clear focus and and fundamentally functional business model. Uh, if you are serving your customers' primary needs and and uh, that they uh, you, they need your service, then you are actually going to be fine in any environment. And this is witnessed by the fact that uh, in the light of COVID-19, our revenues have only taken a very modest drop, uh, and primarily this coming from the uh, collapse of travel industry so you don't see so many card payments uh, abroad anymore but it's actually been pretty uh, insignificant compared to many others and the uh, second i would like to say that um, in order to kick back on uh, one demonstration of uk fintech's resilience and 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 sort of uh, ability to 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 change things quickly is that because customers expectations are incredibly high uh, this kind of forces fintechs to to change their ways and reconfigure their thinking incredibly fast so for example when cash uh, cash usage uh, dropped and uh, the travel disappeared overnight pretty much uh, fintech started focusing on okay how can we actually uh, take advantage of this in terms of uh, what do we do next uh, contactless payments was uh, one of the aspects that was uh, heavily promoted and i think the world as we know it is, is, is has fundamentally changed and uh, those people who also were maybe resisting the change a little bit and we're heavily uh, cash focused. I think the, uh, the, the focus now on contactless payments, uh, real time, contactless, uh, I, I think many people have now, uh, many users have now changed their behaviors as well. So I think I would like to say the speed of uh, how quickly fintechs were able to respond, uh, that's, that's, um, that's one of the strengths. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go and uh, uh, pose a couple of questions with just 10 minutes left. Uh, from our from our audience, and actually one of them uh, it was a question I was going to ask anyway. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to go to Vika and Dominic first on this because it is a forward-looking question on the future of uh, UK fintech and what are the basically kind of what's the next big area where we can expect fintech to expand in the UK? Um, Vika, can I ask you first? Yeah. That's, a, that's an easy one. I've got two words for you, embedded finance. Um, we believe that financial services are the central nervous system of the world. They touch everything. And um, there is a huge opportunity right now um, for, for financial services to enable or support other industries. So anything that requires a payment layer, anything that requires a lending or credit layer, anything that requires a risk management, insurance risk management layer. 
is is a big opportunity for for fintech and i think especially post covid we had a global health crisis that led to a global financial crisis and we suddenly realized that we had prepared ourselves for efficiency but not resilience so there is a massive opportunity right now um and, and i think timing is crucial here because you know we know that the biggest successes have happened have started either during or right after a big financial crisis and i think it's super exciting right now because not only will there be a lot of opportunity not only will there be a lot of innovation but whoever's part of it right now gets to play a role in shaping the world for the next decades and and, and build legacies so I think there's an unprecedented um, opportunity and there is a lot of exciting things that we expect to see out of broader financial services. Very interesting. Do Dominic, from your point of view, where's, where's, where should we be thinking of uh, investing at the moment? What's going to happen next? I think there are lots of interesting trends and I would say that you know backing brilliant entrepreneurs in choppy waters tends to serve people very well. The kind of Jeff Bezos every day is day one is a good mindset to have and that's why early stage growth businesses run by brilliant people often outperform in, in, in uncertain times. Areas in fintech that I think are interesting, well actually SMEs as a customer base I think are very poorly served generally by incumbent banks. We're seeing lots of innovation, um, you know, global economies are going to have to really support SMEs. They typically represent up to 80% of an economy, um, but actually established financial services industry don't serve them terribly well. So we, we're looking at that as an area that we've got a couple of very interesting businesses in our portfolio, Capitalize, which is helping to uh, find lending for SMEs, and Provise, which is helping uh, companies with trade finance using AI, very interesting. And then one other area which I touched on before, which I think you know is just very interesting, is the insurance industry. So you know the insurance industry is enormous, sclerotic, quite profitable, not terribly good at innovating itself. And I think that we will see a huge wave, it's only just begun, of insure tech businesses. There's one example that I'll pull out, um, a business that we backed from day one, uh, called Buy Miles. It's a car insurance business um, that is what it says. It's uh, it's car insurance by the mile as opposed to an annual premium. So it's fair and it's um it's just raised a lot of funding and will become a household name in in the UK. Um, and of course, in during lockdown, when everyone is wondering why am I paying car insurance, um, they can't believe their luck. But I think we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of innovation in the insurance industry. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, with five minutes to go, I'm going to go round the the virtual table that we have here, and just ask uh, as a as just kind of a wrap up. I'm just going to ask all of you, um, with our audience in mind, just to kind of shape in one minute the key factors you think that. Uh, uh, investors here from Saudi Arabia should should really, really want to kind of consider um, when looking at the UK and and uh, what, what, what do you think the, the best thing we could leave them with is today um, to think about? Uh, Norris, for you first. Uh, COVID-19, in, interestingly enough, has done uh, lots of resetting. So I think there is fantastic deals out there. Just, uh, just, uh, just uh, check out the UK uh, fintech right now. is a, it's the best time to invest. Okay, that you didn't even use your whole minute there. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Martin, to you next. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think um, uh, for me, there, there's two key takeaways for the for the Saudi market. One is uh, there's an opportunity to leverage, I guess, the financial muscle uh, to actually uh, uh, get on top of, uh, learn from and replicate best practice from different markets around the world by uh, smart investing and creating those networks. Uh, the other one is uh, the, the, the nature of embedded finance, as, as Vika said, or uh, virtual uh, finance is that the, the new digital financial services don't really observe national borders anymore. 
So there's actually an opportunity to create a, a new financial powerhouse, which is completely disconnected from the physical locations, which were key uh, to the future, uh, in the past, in, in the future. So in certain subsectors of the market, I, I think there's an opportunity for, for new financial centers to, to appear. So I do remember when I was still living in Sydney some years back, there was a, a, a huge effort to try and create the, the green investment industry center of excellence in, in Sydney, and they were competing with Singapore, arguably have lost. But that's one example, I think, of, of where uh, there's opportunities to sort of completely relocate where the centers of excellence and the, the dominant share of new markets for financial services will come from. Uh, and I think, you know, Saudi has some really strong traits to be able to choose some of those market sectors to try and play in. Excellent. And and Vika, your, your thoughts on this? Yes, I think that, um, you know, if I were um, an investor um, right now considering, you know, how can I engage with, with UK FinTech is, you know, I said it before, I'll say it again, partnerships and collaborations. And what I'd be thinking about is what learnings are there to be gained and what value can we create together um, to make Vision 2030 a reality and a big success? Excellent, excellent. Dominic, I come to you for the last word on this of the webinar. What are your thoughts? I'd better, I'd better not mess it up then. You've got, um, you've got one minute. <laughs> <laughs> So look, I mean, on a certain level, I think that fintech is super exciting. And, you know, the people on this call and many others in our industry are working very hard to build the kind of next generation of companies. And that's going to deliver financial return. So, you know, whether there's an investor listening in who's thinking about investing in London or Europe um, or indeed looking at investing regionally uh, in the Middle East. There are opportunities uh, in both. And, you know, we think that there's going to be increased disruption, increased innovation, um, and a, if anything, the, the, the crisis that we're in now makes now an excellent time to be backing early stage growth businesses. There will be more talent available um, and valuations of these companies will be more sensible. So, um, you know, on a purely financial basis, it feels like the time is right to invest in fintech, whether that be in the UK or elsewhere. And to, to Vika's point, it is a global business. You know, the, the, the businesses that we're backing, you know, we back Martin. He's building a global business, um, not a UK business. It's headquartered in the UK, but with, but, you know, with a global client base. So it's exciting times. Great. Thank you very much. And, and that's the, uh, to everyone on the webinar, that's the thought I would leave you with now, as Dominic just said, the time is right to invest. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking part today. It's been very, very insightful. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone listening on the webinar. Uh, can I just uh, let you know that there will be a half hour break, but then encourage you to log back in again for the second session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.